Hello, uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, thank you so much for uh, joining us for our very first uh, Lunch with a Friend series of live video presentations. I am uh, so very glad that, that you're with us. I'm uh, Chris Knopp, Executive Director of, of Friends of the Boundary Waters Wilderness. I want to begin by extending my, uh, my best wishes to all of you and your family. The, the COVID-19 uh, virus is presenting some very new and very challenging times for all of us, and, and we're all in this together. For over 40 years, Friends of the Boundary Waters Wilderness has been the leader in protecting the boundary waters. Today, our work focuses on, on, on three areas, uh, wilderness, people, and community. Uh, we protect the wilderness primarily right now through our lawsuits and legislative work to stop uh, the twin metals and polymet sulfide mines. For, for people, we have our No Boundaries to the Boundary Waters program through which we connect, uh, especially students, to the boundary waters. We have scholarships that provide uh, wilderness uh, uh, canoe trips for, for students, and we also have an education program that reaches out to schools all across Minnesota to educate our, our students about, about the boundary waters. Uh, for community, we understand that the, the Boundary Waters uh, communities and the, the, the Boundary Waters itself have a shared, a shared future. And right now, if you look on our website under our Thriving Communities tab, we have uh, resources for all the small businesses that are gateways to the Boundary Waters and how they can reach uh, some of the federal funds that are available uh, for small businesses during this uh, COVID-19 pandemic. Every good canoe trip begins with, with route planning, and that is today's uh, topic, uh, Boundary Waters Route Planning uh, Tips and Tricks. And we are so very, very fortunate to have, uh, as our presenter, Dan Pauley. Uh, Dan is a, a, a true Renaissance man. He is a, a former uh, Friends Board Chair. He's an attorney. He's the author of a highly acclaimed uh, guidebook, and, and that's why he's uh, our presenter today. And he's also the publisher of, of uh, Maps of the Boundary Waters. Uh, my co-host today is, is Lee Vu. Uh, Lee Vu is a current board member. Uh, she is uh, um, a, a, a digital professional, a digital marketing professional, and uh, also a noted paddler in her own right. She's uh, uh, paddled to the Arctic Circle, uh, the length of the Mississippi River, uh, among other uh, noted uh, uh, paddling trips. Before we begin here, there are uh, a couple of housekeeping items here. If you look at the bottom of your screen, if you move your cursor to the bottom of your screen, you'll see a few icons. There is a Q&A icon down there, and you can use that to ask questions of Lee Vu and of myself, and we'll, we'll answer those during the, the, course of our, uh, the course of Dan's presentation to the best of our, our ability here. There's also a chat icon, and you can use that chat icon to make comments. And again, Lee Vu and I will try to respond to those, uh, those comments as, as, as best we can. And finally, you'll see a poll icon. During the course of Dan's presentation, we'll ask two questions of you, and you can uh, use that icon to respond to, to those questions. So you, uh, you cannot talk during, during the presentation here, but through those means, you can uh, communicate with us. Um, I, without, without further ado, uh, this will last about 30 minutes. We'll, uh, I'm gonna hand this off to, to Dan Polly. So Dan, please take it away. Thanks so much. Great, thank you, Chris. Um, I'm going to start off, uh, we're going to be hitting uh, tips, tips and tricks, but what I'm going to start off with is um, going into a little bit of an overview and in, in the, in the concept that, you know, the Boundary Waters is the largest wilderness area, actually the most popular wilderness area uh, in the United States, one of the largest in the country as well. And there's over a million acres of area to explore with over a thousand street lakes and streams and 2,000 campsites and innumerable portages. So uh, what we're gonna talk about today is some examples of routes as well as some suggestions on how to design your own route. But literally you could spend your entire life, uh, you know, picking through different routes, uh, you know, navigating different networks of lakes. Um, and so what I'm gonna hopefully provide is some ideas on how to design your own routes and some that I think you might like. So with, uh, uh, with that, let me start off. What I'm gonna do is talk about again, principles and then go into some example routes. Now, when I think about route principles, I would say there's maybe five that I think are pretty important if you're gonna be planning a route. So the first one is gonna be who is going. Uh, you know, the Boundary Waters uh, is, is open to everybody and everybody can have a great time there. My, my kids were up there before they went to kindergarten and you know, you can be uh, a, a very senior person and still make it up there. Uh, it's, it's worth noting that there are things you can do and routes that are wonderful 
uh, for people with very limited mobility or maybe who can't camp in the wilderness overnight. So I'm gonna give you some ideas on day trips today as well. So it's really something that anybody can and hopefully will find the time to enjoy. And then I'm gonna go into uh, some aspects of uh, how much you, distance you can cover in a day, portages, you know, the number length and difficulty certainly makes a huge difference on a route. Types of lakes we're gonna talk about, um, and then some of the activities you might wanna do that could influence where you're gonna go. Um, the first thing is distance and daily travel estimates. Now, from my experience and been on lots and lots of trips with people of all different skill levels and objectives, I think generally, when you're looking at a map and you say, hey, how far can we go today? I would say the typical group is gonna go two miles per hour com combining typical portages, typical lakes, okay? And you know, if you're gonna stop for lunch or something, that's not counting that. So two hours of moving. You're gonna probably go three miles an hour, maybe on the water, slower than that on the portages. Um, but if you're making some plans and you think, hey, we wouldn't mind paddling for say three to three hours a day, that's kind of what we want to do. We're going to leave at noon and try to be at our campsite at three o'clock. That's Dan, maybe. Excuse me, Dan, if you yep. uh, please move your uh, PowerPoint forward, the slides. Oh. oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, I'm not sure why that's not doing that. Um, just a second here. Uh, Just one second, I apologize. It should be working. Slideshow. Hmm. Uh, just bear with me for a second. It says it's doing it. Okay, sorry. So that was the, can you see that now, Chris? Yes, we're all set okay. here. So this is what I had at the start. And then we had uh, this slide and then went into this part where I was just talking about how much distance you can cover. So generally, you know, distance uh, daily travel estimates, like I said, two miles per hour. And for most groups, from my experience, six to 12 miles a day is what they might want to cover. Uh, you know, you do more, you can less, but that's a good ballpark number. Uh, as you're sitting out, setting out your maps and thinking, hey, what could we cover today that we would enjoy? Now, the big variable is often portages. And so generally, um, you know, my recommendation is if you're with new visitors, you're going to have portages to be relatively few and relatively, um, and you're going to want them to be relatively uh, short. I would generally say not doing more than 100 rods for a person who's never been to the Boundary Waters before. And a rod is six and a half feet. So there's, uh, that's what, rods are what's gonna be on your map. And so uh, there's 320 rods to a mile. So you can kind of keep that in mind that, um, you know, as you're planning things out, 100 rods is gonna be more than a quarter mile. And so, you know, if, if you've never been to the Boundary Waters before, that's kind of a lot to carry your gear across if you're not kind of used to that. So that would be an idea. Um, another thing I would say about the portages is that um, they are maintained by the Forest Service at different levels. And the portages that are near entry points, especially popular entry points, are gonna be easier to cover. They're gonna be uh, maintained with a, a, a nicer trail. And as you get into the interior, those portages are gonna be rougher. And I'll give you some examples of that uh, in, my, um, uh, in my routes. And then also that, you know, if you go over a long portage, say a two or 300 rod portage, and there's no other way across to those lakes, generally you're gonna find that when you get across that portage, it's gonna have fewer people than on the other side. So if you're looking for more isolation, uh, going over long portages into the interior is a great way to do that. Um, next up here um, is uh, you're gonna wanna think about the types of activities you might wanna do. If you're gonna fish, I, uh, a great website to pull fishing data from is the, um, uh, DNR Lake Finder website that has surveys even in the boundary water. Some of them are old, but they'll tell you what kind of fish are in a lake. Uh, if you want to go blueberry picking, uh, a good thing to note, that's a seasonal activity, obviously. So late in the summer uh, is when you're most likely going to get blueberries. But areas that have burned over in the last 10 or 20 years are going to have generally better blueberry picking because blueberries respond to fire. And I got some routes in that I'm going to show you that would have some of that. Uh, if you want to go swimming, uh, Look, if you're going to be early season, a smaller lake or a shallow lake is going to have um, 
uh, is going to warm up earlier. So if something that's you're going to be swimming in June, you've got kids or whoever you think you want to do a lot of swimming, uh, smaller lakes uh, and shallow lakes are what you'd want to look for. Uh, people kind of think of the Boundary Waters primarily as a canoe area, but there's good hiking uh, and uh, in parts of it, especially up on the north part of the Gunflint Trail where the border route trail runs. Uh, I got a route that I'm going to point out some of that. And then last, uh, you know, the Boundary Waters is in a really incredible dark sky area. Um, one of the darkest places in the lower 48, and that's something that the Friends has worked on to protect uh, that dark, dark, skies, dark skies. But if you're going to go uh, and want to see, you know, maybe the northern lights, especially in the fall, or see stars, one thing to keep in mind, it can be a good idea to um, schedule your route so that it doesn't interfere with or that it's not uh, interrupted by the, like the moon. So you'd want to have the moon not be out at night when you're going to be out up there if that's something you wanted to see. Um, next, uh, I've got, uh, let me see here, is uh, this is kind of an important point that people don't always think about and that is the lake sizes and shapes. Uh, and you want to pay attention to whether there's big open water stretches, in particular if there's large west east exposures usually the wind in the boundary water is going to come from the west and uh to the east that's not always the case but that's where you'll have a problem sometimes and here is an example brule lake great lake we're going to talk about some routes there but you can see from this red arrow there's a good three or four mile stretches that go east and west and so if you have a wind coming out of the west um, you're going to get big waves by the time you get way downwind and if you're going into it or or it's to your back, that's maybe not such a big problem, but going across it sideways can be an issue. Uh, and so for newer paddlers, I generally recommend trying to stay off those big stretches um, or giving yourself an extra day or two in case you get windbound. Also, you can travel in the morning, early in the mornings, oftentimes less windy. Uh, now what I'm gonna go into is some example routes. Uh, very, you know, some of these can be done in a day because they're just real short. Other ones would be, you know, could take a week or longer. Um, depending on what you were uh, interested in doing. Um, and I'm going to lead off by just explaining just a little bit of an overview of where you can go. So oftentimes people think of, you know, when you think of the Bounty Waters, there's four sections or three sections each, actually, rather. And people kind of anchor towards like there's the Ely area over here. And then on the east, you have Grand Marais. Those are the two largest sort of border communities. And out of Ely, you can go up the Echo Trail. Um, and you can also come on this side from Orr, and then there'll be small forest service roads going into the Boundary Waters from here. And then you can also take the Fernburg Road up towards, this is Snowbank Lake, and there's entry points all along here. And then on the southern side of this main section, there's little forest service roads as well that will have a dotted number of different entry points. And then you can go up to Sawville Lake, which is out of Tofty from, on the Sawville Trail, and then you can either come in, it's not shown here, but the Arrowhead uh, Trail goes up to this section, but you can come in from either side. Uh, and then all along here, there are entry points and you enter the Boundary Waters at a specific day and time, not time, but a specific day and entry point. Um, and so all of these routes coming up are gonna be for specific entry points. Uh, the first one that I have is going in at Alton Lake. And this is up up the Sawbill Trail. So you'd get here from uh, Tofty. And what's nice about this is this is a great entry point for somebody who uh, maybe has limited mobility um, because you can pull up right here. There's the Sawbill Outfitters, which is a, a, great, uh, a great outfitter. They could rent a canoe if you needed it. There's camping right there that you can stay at. Um, and then uh, you can make a day trip that would either go say right over into Alton Lake or up Sawbill Lake, or you can do a little loop here through the Kelso River. There's some extensions here, there's a long portage, but this, this is a great route if you just had a day, part of a day, or if you're limited mobility. If you, if you cannot portage at all, just stay on Sawbill Lake. If you can portage a little bit, you can go over to Alton Lake. And also what is nice about this is, um, it's a nor as I said, it's a north-south lake, so you're not gonna have the wind generally that could create some waves. This is gonna be a relatively easy lake to navigate and get around on. Now, another lake, uh, another route that would be excellent, again, for somebody with limited mobility, would be coming in uh, to Basswood Lake, which is going to be east of Ely, off of the Fernburg Road. And we have you coming in here off of Fall Lake, which is entry point 24. Again, Fall Lake has a campground, so you can stay there overnight if you want. Um, and then you take four portages up to Pipestone Bay, 
and all of those portages are really well maintained. Like they're you they're not they're not rough. Uh, this this is actually a motorized route, so people do bring small uh, uh, fishing boats with 25 horsepower outboards, so they can pull them over the over that route over the portages. Um, but if you uh, go this way, once you get north of Jackfish Bay, the port, the boats are no longer motorized, boats are no longer allowed. And actually up on the north side here is Basswood Falls, which is quite impressive. Uh, it's not like a big tall, tall falls, but lots of water coming over. Um, excellent fishing in Basswood Lake. Actually, the state record northern pike came out of Basswood Lake. Um, and uh, that's, this is a great, this is a great route, uh, really pretty. Um, and again, you could do it in a day trip if you just were going to go part way, or you could make a, a few days out of exploring Basswood Lake. Uh, the next one I have uh, that I wanted to highlight is the numbers chain. That's uh, coming in at Lake One and then going into Lake Two, Three, and Four. And uh, this is a great route um, for a few reasons. Number one, again, not too tough on portages. And uh, there's some good walleye fishing in here if you're a fisher, uh, fisher person. And uh, what's kind of neat about it is the Pagami Creek fire was in uh, 2011 and it burned much of the south side of this route and but it did not burn the north side of this route. And so like if you go to Lake 1 and Lake 2, the northern shores uh, are, had, were not burned and the southern shores were burned. And so you can take a look at the regeneration. There's going to be some fireweed growing. It's a few years long now, so there's the, the jack pine forest has started to regenerate. And if you're a bird watcher, what's neat about this is you've got two very different ecosystems on each side of these lakes. And so you're really more likely to see a variety of birds and some birds that you wouldn't see together otherwise. Uh, and also, you know, moose like a regenerating forest. So uh, moose are always going to be unpredictable to see, but you know, in that regenerating forest is going to give you more odds of seeing that. Uh, one thing I would note on this route uh, is you can see it's very twisty and turny. So you want to like hone your navigation skills, make sure you have a good map. Uh, you might want your GPS along, but remember your GPS could fall to the bottom of the lake or could break. So you want to navigate well um, and, uh, uh, you know, just um, be alert to where you are because you could, you could get lost. But if you're, if you're careful, you'll, you'll find your way out of it. Um, the next route I have highlighted here, now we're getting into some longer routes, is going from Brule uh, to Long Island. And this is going to, you're going to get to Brule up the Caribou Trail, which is going to start um, off of uh, Highway 61 on the North Shore. So this is going to come, this is e east of Tofty is where we're going to start, but like halfway up the North Shore. And you can drive up to Brule Lake. Um, interestingly, this is not too far away. Right down here, south of where the 41 is, is the um, is uh, Eagle Mountain. So that's the tallest place in Minnesota. In fact, I think it's one of the tallest places in, within 500 miles. And that's in the Boundary Waters. We think about the Boundary Waters as a great canoe area, and it is, but it's actually also, besides having great lakes, it has, uh, you know, the highest place in the state of Minnesota. Um, but what we have here would be coming out in Brule, and then sort of the islands are not shown in here because you just show the highlights, but you'd head up through the what's called the cones and then into Davis Lake and then some really nice interior lakes. Kiskadena, you could camp on. It's a long, thin lake that's just absolutely beautiful. Um, long Island Lake is a relatively interior lake, but lots of islands, great camping, great island campsites. Then you'd follow west down into Frost Lake which uh, has beautiful uh, white pine forest around it and actually some beaches on Frost Lake of all things, uh, just uh, from the wave action, uh, sand beaches. Then you drop into Cherokee and out through Brule. Cherokee is gonna have more people than anywhere else on this route in all likelihood. Um, so you'd wanna be thinking about that, get your campsite early if you're coming in that way. Um, next up uh, is, uh, this This is a great route. This is actually starting as well as, as as the route we had at Alton, but it is going to stretch out through the south side of Alton, and this this route initially goes along some uh, some lakes like Grace and Phoebe and Hazel, all pretty, and some rivers, and then you get up to Polly and Coma and then Melberg, uh, all of which are nice lakes. Now uh, that stretch has pretty pretty straightforward portages, but then you're going to turn to the east and you're gonna hit over uh, the Laos River and Laos Lake 
and a number of lakes that has probably some of the most rugged portages in the boundary waters. So if you, uh, you know, if you have bad ankles, this is not the route for you. Most, most people who kind of came out of Alton or come out are going to take and go south. And uh, there's a couple ways to south onto, say, like one-way routes. But uh, if you're sort of a diehard and want a longer route that's going to get you into some really cool interior areas, this is great. I love this area, actually. Uh, Wine Lake, too, has nice lake trout fishing in it. And then you're going to drop down on uh, from Zenith Lake down to Kelso Lake on a mile and a half portage. Uh, fortunately, by that point, your your food barrel or food pack is pretty much hopefully half empty. Um, so you got less weight and then you're going to pull out uh, here at Sawbill. And so that's that's a that's a fun route, uh, but but a, but a harder route. Um, another route that's long, um, but a little easier on the portages would be this eastern loop starting at um, uh, Moose Lake, which is entry point 25. This is near the eastern end of the uh, Fernberg Road, which is so then that's east of Ely. And you can rent canoes right on Moose Lake if you wanted. And uh, this has us going in uh, to uh, Ensign Lake, which is a great large lake. Uh, you could camp there. And then there's a bunch of smaller lakes that head east uh, and north over to uh, Knife Lake. Um, and then Knife Lake, you would sweep back to the west. Uh, Knife Lake is a, is, is a great lake in so many regards. It's right on the Canadian border, but it's also interesting. Uh, that is actually where uh, Dorothy Moulter, the root beer lady, lived for many years on the Isle of Pines, which is right about, I think, in here. Uh, that, there's nothing, uh, her, her homestead is now a museum in Ely, so you could stop there first, and then you could check out where she lived. Um, buy some root beer maybe beforehand. And then you can come all the way down and you're gonna drop into Birch Lake and then back down uh, here to, um, to Moose Lake and your way out. Uh, interestingly, so this route, uh, I'll point out that so all of the water here is gonna flow to the west and north to Rainy Lake. The next route we're gonna show here is um, actually moving down to, uh, is heading to the far west, excuse me, the far east boundary waters. And this is, um, I call it Minnesota Mountains, uh, because this has some of the biggest terrain changes in all the boundary waters. And, uh, you know, uh, I always encourage people to learn a little bit about the geology, and I won't go into the detail here, but what ends up happening in this area, you have a whole lot of long skinny lakes, and they are connected on their ends by relatively flat sections. And but if you go across their middles, it's big hills, okay? And so the route I have uh, suggested here is suggested, excuse me, is coming and starting at Bearskin Lake, going through Duncan and Rose, which are both trout lakes. Duncan to Rose actually has uh, one of the few portages in the Valley Water that's a named portage. That's the stairway portage, which uh, is a rough hewn stairway. Um, I think originally uh, there was one put in by the Civilian Conservation Corps. And then you're gonna follow along the uh, the uh, international boundary, which is actually corresponds to what used to be, or what was the original Voyager Highway, and that became the international boundary by treaty. Uh, you go through Mountain Lake and then Moose Lake and North Fowl and loop around, uh, and then into Pine Lake, which is a is is a long lake. But at the end of Pine, there is uh, there is the uh, it's called Johnson Falls, which is one of the prettier waterfalls in the Boundary Waters. There's a little trail to it. Um, and it's kind of a, sort of like, it would be like a it's, a, it's your classic little waterfall. Not tons of water, but it's really pretty, kind of like a little grotto back in there. And then you can head out through Caribou Lake, uh, trout fishing in there, and then back out uh, through um, Clearwater Lake. So this, this is a, a neat lake. And if you really want to see some terrain changes, this is great for that. Notably, um, along this section here, south of Mountain and Moose, is where the border route trail part of it runs and uh, great vistas up there. I've done it in the summer, I've done it in the winter, and some of the campsites have trails right up to it, um, and then you could hike for part of a day, and then um, other places you can, you can land and like go in um, from, from, from the shore at different spots and just do a partial trip. So um, that is a, a bunch of routes and some ideas on how to sort of plan a trip, like in terms of routes. I wanted to let everybody know that the Friends of the Boundary Waters now is posting some ideas, including these ones are all from there uh, on their website. And so if we can move over, I've got, here's the, 
Friends of the Boundary Waters website. And if you go in here to explore in canoe routes, uh, these routes, and there'll be more added, but these routes and others are all right there and you can find them uh, and explore kind of routes and see what you'd be interested in doing. Um, and then um, with that, I am going to turn this back over to Chris. Thank you uh, for participating today. Uh, uh, great, Dan, but before we conclude this and, and before you lean back too far, Dan, there was uh, one, one question uh, that someone asked about the, the direction of the routes that, um, you know, can you go in either direction of the, of the routes you laid out? Maybe you want to talk a little bit about the impact of uh, wind direction and, and lake uh, and, uh, and whether a length is, uh, whether a lake goes east, west, or north, south, and how that kind of impacts the, the direction of a route. Yeah, so um, good question. Uh, really, all the routes are kind of reversible, but if you looked at, um, generally, if you're going to come across a lake, my recommendation would be to to, to take, um, to avoid open, those open east-west stretches going sort of sideways to it, right? And so um, if you, you know, or, or have it be a relatively short portion. Um, and so, you know, uh, sometimes you might need to even adjust your route on the fly, but they're, they're generally reversible, but like take that, um, that route with, uh, with um, uh, Brule Lake on it, you know, like say you're, you're gonna do that route and you're starting off and like it's a really nice day, then you might wanna like head west onto Brule and then go around because you can take Brule easily in that condition. But if, um, if instead it's not a good day, um, you know, you might wanna, you might wanna adjust your route accordingly so that you, you're taking, you know, the difficult part um, the first day when the weather was, would be good, would be an example. Great, Dan. And well, we have a, a few other outstanding questions here from, from uh, our participants. One is, do you have a, a good recommendation for a lake that would be a, um, a, a good base camp for day paddles? You have a favorite one for that? Mm -hmm. So, you know, uh, one that I think is really nice is um, uh, I like going up to Seagull Lake on the west side of uh, uh, the Gunflint Trail. It's a great lake. Um, you know, a uh, little bit has motorized on it, but most of it does not. And there's a couple little portages you can go across. You can go up towards um, uh, Grandpa Lake is one where there's a bass fishing lake right off of that you can go to. There's a trout lake to the south you can go to if you wanted to do that. Um, and you know that lake itself has quite a bit you can explore. Um, so that's actually a, a great day trip. I always think that would be a great day trip lake to be honest. Okay. Great, and we we have a uh, another question, a couple questions that kind of point to this. What's the, the, the best time to go for a week with the with the family? Uh, you know, thinking about bugs and, and other considerations. If you were you know between May and September, what what would you what would you recommend? Well, the most popular time is probably in the middle of the first two weeks of August because that is like generally mosquitoes have diminished quite a bit by that period of time. Um, you know, in early uh, the early part of the year uh, in May, you'll sometimes have black flies. And then in June, you will have uh, mosquitoes. Now, both of those are, are, are manageable, right? Um, but uh, if you wanted to minimize those, typically August is when that's gonna be minimized as well as then into September. You know, a weekend September trip is great. I've done, I've actually done MEA weekends that were really great, although that's often like getting to the end and it's a little bit on the cold side. Um, and, you know, Chris, since you mentioned that, we're not really talking about gear today and maybe we can do one, but uh, there are some um, rain flies. I think uh, we could maybe put N-E-R-O, I think Nero, but I have to look at the name, but there are some rain flies you can get now that have like a drop down bug net um, that is not that heavy. And so if you're traveling with kids, that could be a great thing to set up. Um, uh, very lightweight, but it's basically a rain fly, but then has netting on it. And you can rent them at places like Paragus. But that's, you know, if, if people are concerned about the bugs, that is actually a, a nice thing to have so that, you know, you can avoid insects being a big problem. Also, I'd say if you're traveling with kids, keep in mind that the mosquitoes are going to be more active once the sun sets. And so, you know, get your camp set up, have your cooking done. So, you know, by the time the sun is starting to set, 
you are, you know, you can be in your tents and get ready to go to sleep and then get up early in the morning. Great. We've uh, we've had a, a few questions uh, from uh, participants asking about the impact of COVID-19 uh, and, and getting permits. And I spoke with the supervisor of the Superior National Forest last week. And uh, as of as of as of last week, the information was that uh, they will make it a decision in the upcoming weeks whether uh, whether the, the, the they'll open the permits up after May 1st. So they are still in a, a, a wait and, and see mo uh, uh, mode right now. They're uh, following the advice of um, uh, Governor Walls and other public health professionals on that. So so right now, uh, it is a wait and, uh, wait and see position from the, the Superior National Forest on uh, on the impact of, of COVID-19. And, and we will have information on our website um, uh, uh, updating that information as, as soon as we get it, and we'll we're in regular contact with the Superior National Forest on on, on that on that point. Um, for for Dan, there another question is if if people wanted to combine uh, some canoeing and, and hiking, uh, what would be a, a, a good a, a couple good lakes for for that? So canoeing and hiking. So um, one of the routes I pointed out was doing that off of. Uh, uh, the, the lakes like say going up to Clearwater Lake up on the you know northeast side of the Boundary Waters um, and there you have the border route trail. In addition um, you can go in the Kekakavik Trail runs from the Gunflint Trail all the way over to basically the Echo Trail and so if you were to go in at Snowbank Lake um, there's some hiking in fact the route that we talked about with um, uh, Lake Juan that one of the, there's a trail, I think it's maybe the Disappointment Lake Trail that is a spur off of that, that crosses one of the portages. And so that you could do as well. And then there's uh, the Pow Wow Trail and um, there's a couple other trails that you can take, but actually like if I really was gonna hike the, the I would probably go up. Along a border in the Boundary Waters without an actual trail. So that's not as easy. Um, so generally going down one of those trails would be what I would do. But the border route um, off of say Clearwater or Duncan, that, those are great areas. Great. If, if, uh, if someone wanted to see moose, is there a, a particular area that, that has a, a lot of uh, good moose habitat where you might have a good chance of seeing moose? So we all know that the moose uh, population has been in decline. I think it's maybe stabilized now, uh, but um, I know parts of the Gunflint seem to be getting more moose than they had in the past. I know uh, we were just talking to the folks who have, uh, and I think they posted on their blog, who own Tuscarora Outfitters off of Round Lake up in off of the Gunflint Trail, and some moose was licking salt off of his truck in his, in his parking, in his driveway, you know, like in the winter. So, um, that's, I, that's where I would, that would be an option. And I, I would say going into those areas where there has been fires um, a few years ago, that's where you're most likely to see it. I've, I've, the, where I've seen moose recently have been those areas. Like I've been on Seagull Lake and areas that burned over a few years later, there's little, you know, the little saplings and stuff that the moose like to, to eat, especially um, early in the season before everything else is growing. That's, that's a good spot to see them. Um, and actually, you know, I kind of think earlier in the season is often a great time to spot them when they're, when everything's not grown in as much. Um, but uh, the Pagami Creek fire was another area we mentioned, and you Google that. And actually, if you just go on Google Maps, you'll see where things had burned. But that's kind of the southwest area around Lake One and east towards uh, Sawbill Lake. And um, those areas, you know, if they don't now over time, hopefully will be really nice moose habitat. Dan, and uh, we have a, a question about someone that would like uh, to see uh, uh, petroglyphs and, and waterfalls and, and how to get information about that. And I will, again, recommend people take a look at Dan's guidebook. He has some information on where those waterfalls and, and, and petroglyphs are. But, but Dan, maybe you want to point out uh, a, a couple spots where people can, can, can uh, see both of those. Yeah, that's a good question. So actually, the easiest place to go um, which, you know, we didn't have time to put all the routes in. Would, if you go into South Hegman Lake, which is off of the Echo Trail, and um, you, can, they, you can go right from there. That's about a 30 minute drive from Ely, maybe a little more. 
And then there's a couple of portage from South Hagman. I think it ends at Tease Lake or Tease Lake is the final one. And there's an over oh, sort of an overhanging rock wall where you'll be able to see um, some pictographs. And those ones uh, you'll see in pictures, th those ones are like in books and stuff. There's a, like a, some moose type figures and, and things like that. So that's a very easy day trip. In addition, up on Crooked Lake, there are some that are, um, uh, if you would go, I can't remember if it's Friday Bay, but there's some that you can see there as well. And then off of the, um, off of the Kawishui River, there's a tour a trip you can take in. I, uh, the, the name of the small lake uh, uh, slips my mind right now, but there's some you can see there as well. And then waterfalls, I would note, all along the border, there's a lot of water that's moving. You know, the, the boundary waters is at the top of the watershed. And so um, that's one of the reasons the water is so clear in the boundary waters or, or so, so pure is like really at the top of the watershed at the continental divide. But all along the border, um, especially say from Basswood to the, to, the, um, to the west towards Rainy Lake, there's great waterfalls, sometimes campsites right by them. And these are just really like raging rivers a lot of times at those places with sometimes like 20, 30 foot drops of water kind of cascading down. Curtain Falls uh, is up there at the west end of Crooked Lake. You've got Basswood Falls. Um, and then, you know, uh, th those would be a couple examples. Johnson Falls was another like really nice one that was on uh, Pine Lake. Great. Uh, there were uh, a couple a couple other questions, uh, you know, to respond to the question that uh, dealing with the COVID-19 uh, again, right, right now, uh, the, the information is, is that uh, um, uh, that the, the Superior National Forest is a, a wait and see mode. I think maybe by next week, we may have some more information from them, but it is not clear that after uh, May 1st that you will be able to get into the boundary waters. So, so for those of you that are planning a, um, uh, an early trip after I out you uh it's it's a wait and see mode right now so uh uh so with with respect to that we'll uh, we'll have to just stay tuned and again we'll have stuff on uh, uh, information on our website to uh, to to deal with that i know that we had a, a, a number of uh, other questions uh dealing with uh sort of planning for the trip with respect to food and equipment and things like that and that will be a topic of a, of an upcoming um uh one uh, of these uh, live video presentations coming up here I know that we're kind of at the end of our, our time here. And, and so I want to, uh, first of all, thank, uh, thank Dan so much for, for that wonderful presentation and, and thank Lee Vu for, for being a, a co-host uh, with me and, um, and, 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 uh, and responding to the, the, the questions and, and the chat comments throughout here. And uh, um, uh, before we, before we uh, conclude, you know, I also want to thank uh, all of you that are, are participating. We had, uh, you know, nearly, nearly 200 people participating today. And, uh, and the strength of Friends of the Boundary Waters Wilderness is, is really because of you. And, and the, the strength of protecting the Boundary Waters is, is, is because of you. And, and that has been uh, uh, the, the strength for the last 40 years and will be uh, the strength of the organization for, for the next 40 years here. Uh, I responded to some questions dealing with, with the availability of this presentation in some of the Q&A in the chat rooms, but I'll repeat it here. Um, the, we, will re we are recording this presentation and we'll make this recording available on our website. Uh, for people who want uh, a copy of Dan's PowerPoint presentation, uh, you, you, uh, we'll send it to you if you email us at info at friends-bwca.org. Again, that's uh, info at friends hyphen, that's friends with an S at the end, hyphen bwca.org. And again, as Dan pointed out on our website, we have, we have this information available that, that you can, uh, can get right, right from our website on our Explore tab and go into canoe routes. And, and also uh, feel free to call our office anytime and ask any one of the staff of, of, about this. So what's next up here? These are weekly presentations uh, every Wednesday at, at 12 noon central time and our next one will be on April 15th. Then this one will be will provide an update on the polymet litigation. And the presenter will be 
Evan Nelson, uh, uh, our, our lead attorney in our litigation to, to stop PolyMet and, and a board member. Uh, this is a, 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 an extraordinary time uh, in, in the history to protect the Boundary Waters from the threat of sulfide mining. And the, the last few months have been absolutely extraordinary. And we have, we have truly turned the tide in the battle against sulfide mining. And the, the PolyMet litigation has uh, has has been the the, the current spear uh, uh, in in that battle, uh, along with our, our lawsuits uh, to to stop Twin Metals. So so. Uh, on April 15th at, at, at 12 noon, uh, please tune in. We will send out uh, 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 invitations how you can register for this, uh, this free webinar. Again, uh, thank you to, to, to Dan and thank you to Lee for being part of this. And, and thank you most of all to all of you for your passion for the Boundary Waters. Thank you so much. Uh, stay safe and stay healthy. Uh, goodbye and have a good afternoon.